All right, what's up, guys? Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> oh. What's up, guys? This is Cream. You're checking out the second episode of Get Down With It. Today, I spoke with Rated R Management, Ron Rodrigo and Nick Damaso. We talked about a ton of topics, but mostly focused on the state of nightlife in 2020 and how we have to take this adapt or die mentality to survive. What's up, guys? This is Cream. We're here with Rated R Management head honcho, Ron Rodrigo, <laughs> and my boy uh, Nick Damaso, Rated R artist, Get Down DJ also. What's up, fellas? Hey, now I'm happy to have you guys here. I feel like we're going to have uh, you know, a real wide, uh, wide-ranging conversation today. But um, first thing I wanted to get into, kind of just hear your stories, DJ story, how you kind of started working together and how you started working with, with Get Down. So basically, uh, I started, like most people, in mobile uh, probably about 12 years ago or so and kind of did that for a while. I was a roadie, uh, light tech, and just kind of event designer, and then I started slowly getting into DJing private parties. Uh, as far as nightlife is concerned and meeting Ron and everything, that was actually through the Red Room uh, in Gansevoort, where I actually wound up opening one night uh, just by chance through a couple different connections and whatnot and uh you know that's where I met Ron and Ron essentially I guess kind of took a liking to me and then we just started working together but we slowly also became friends throughout the process and that's when he actually approached me about the uh the rated R concepts you know that he had been kind of doing for a while I think and uh you know that's when he kind of just started really putting it together and you know I kind of helped out with that um, along with a couple of other people and you know from there it just kind of kept going kept getting new venues and trying out new places and yeah I think it's really funny how you kind of you don't always remember how you started working with somebody it kind of just works right where it's like yeah I met that person like three years ago and we work together all the time now like well, how do we even meet I don't remember that's why I ask everybody because Sometimes I really don't remember how we started working with certain guys. It just kind of flows organically, and it's like, this is a good fit, right? There's so many people. I mean, I feel like once, you once you meet, especially in this type of industry, you meet a good person, like genuinely like honest and good person, and you, uh, you, know, you continuously work with them. You meet someone else, and then next thing you know, you have a crew of guys, and you forgot how you met each one of them because it feels like almost like you're a family for like six years now. And you look back, it's been like two and a half years, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, about myself a little bit, how I got started. Uh, I actually started um, promoting a long time ago, a uh, very long time ago. <laughs> um, I've been doing um, nightlife um, management, uh, general managing, food and beverage directing uh, in hotels and stuff for about 15 years now. Um, I started as a promoter. From then, I realized that it couldn't be, uh, I mean, I'm reaching almost 40 now, <laughs> uh, not to age myself, but um, I realized I couldn't be promoting at that point. Um, you know, my friends started having kids, started having families, and essentially growing up. Um, I really enjoyed doing this, so I led that into getting a gig managing at a rooftop um, in Times Square called Haven Rooftop. Um, believe it or not, I made a lot more money promoting. You could actually make it a business just like you can do DJing and having a company like that. But I realized that I had to get really into the industry and kind of learn the ins and outs because I, I don't DJ. You do not want to hear me DJ or do anything <laughs> of that sort, right? So um, I stayed in my lane. I kind of got to learn what some of the bookers and other people and other venues are looking for and still kept... Uh, you know, kind of what I liked and my creativity in terms of doing bookings, whether it was making flyers or helping curate the night uh, with entertainment, performers, uh, and so on. Um, and then once I finally went through the industry, uh, my last job was um, at the Dream Hotel um, in the Meatpacking. Um, and then I left and saved up some money and continued with Rated R. Um, I started Rated R, I think, maybe about, like, really started it like three years ago, two, two and a half years ago. Um, in terms of how I got connected with Get Down, um, I grew up with Gary W. Uh, I think Gary actually, sorry, Gary, I'm going to age you too. Uh, <laughs> he um, DJed my senior prom, I think, actually. <laughs> and, and if everyone that's watching this right now can close their eyes and just picture 
Gary driving a red Honda Civic with white rims and taking us, <laughs> taking us to Sound Factory. Wow. Uh, taking us to Sound Factory after midnight when it was 18 to get in. I feel like there could be a whole, a whole show yeah. <laughs> just on those, those late night so, trips to Limelight. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, from that, then obviously I, I met you and uh, I mean, the rest is history. We've been working together yeah. since. So I think you hit on a ton of things that I, I want to touch on, but um, the first thing is kind of working your way through the different venues and different lanes of promotion and management and different things. I mean, how has that helped you in being able to start your own company? Yeah, so, I mean, like I kind of touched on before too, it just allows me to kind of, you know, um, while, while the DJ's DJing, while these guys are doing their thing, they don't really have to worry about the politics. I mean, there's always politics and everything, yeah. so I'll, I'll correct that right there, but um, they can focus on playing the music, uh, setting themselves up for the night, um, doing what they gotta do, and then if I'm there, it's great. If I'm not, I've already talked to the manager. Um, I can kind of speak their language, because like, right. I was the GM at certain venues and stuff, so I can speak their language. Um, I kind of have a decent idea as to what they're going to be paying or what they should be paying and uh i can kind of call them out on their bullshit as well right yeah because you've you've kind of been there and you yeah, you've so, booked as a manager at a venue mm -hmm. and you've you know uh did food and beverage so you kind of understand the full business as a whole which is really important because yeah. i feel like most people don't kind of understand that so you can see it from an owner or a booker's perspective what are the things that are important to them right and how yeah. can you bring value in order to help them achieve those things um, it kind of, it kind of sucks nowadays, you know, um, <laughs> where you gotta, you have to do more. I mean, and, I, and I'm sure this is what you and Gary do for your guys too, but you, you gotta do, a, bring a little bit more to the table than necessarily just good DJing, which is, yep. in my opinion, the most important thing. It should uh, be. It, I, it always isn't. No, but exactly. It be. There's other people that are just worried about the Instagram page. I think that some of the, some of the vets, uh, that have been around for a long time really resent that and yep. they you know, they don't want to change with the times. Unfortunately, you do. Um, I think it should be a good balance. Uh, you know, let's say it's like, I value the good DJ more. Um, because if you can come in and you can keep my crowd there, and you, if, if I was a manager, if you can keep my crowd there and have people dancing and spending money, that's worth more to me because I don't know if anyone's going to be there for DJ Ron Rodrigo when half the kids coming in have fake IDs coming into right. the nightclub. They don't know who I am, who the DJ is sometimes, you know? Yeah. Um, but definitely adapting with the times and having a good social media presence. And you got to play the game, unfortunately, you know? Yeah. So I'm going to transition to Nick because I think you brought up being able to be adaptable to the venue or to the needs of what's happening, right? So I think you do a really good job of bringing other things to the table besides just DJing. So I just wanted to talk to you about that and kind of why you started doing that and how it's helped you. Uh, so I, I do a lot of graphic design, uh, which I don't really do it for other people necessarily. It, it actually started happening when I started realizing that places typically don't give you flyers yeah. for the most part. Um, and sometimes they're also not very uh, aesthetically pleasing, Agreed. so <laughs> um, it may not exactly, you know, fit your image. And uh, so I started learning Photoshop, and I started doing my own stuff. Um, and I kind of try and keep them simple, uh, just to avoid, you know, running into any problem. I think, it, you know, the less that you do, the you know less opportunity you have to make something look messy. Right. Uh, so I started doing it for my own, uh, you know, for my own page and everything because. Well, one, I didn't really like what I was being given, if I was given anything at all. And then I started uh, doing it for myself, and it just, I mean, it saves a ton of money because it, it can be pricey, you yeah. know, and it, sometimes it takes uh, two weeks to get, you know, a flyer from somebody, and then it's something that you weren't even looking for, and then you're paying all this money for it. Uh, so it was kind of good. I started doing it for myself, and then, uh, uh, you know, a few other people that I work with started asking me to kind of help them out and yeah. and uh, just another lane for you to help kind of grow your network, right? Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think it's it's helped a lot with uh, like maintaining like an image that you want, you know, as opposed to right. just like, well, I have to post this and, you know, it doesn't really fit, you know, because uh, obviously image is yeah. uh, something that's kind of important in this industry. So it's absolutely <laughs> it's definitely. So, uh, yeah, because when I think of you, I always think of like a clean brand and a clean image. All your designs are pretty um, minimalistic, which I really like. And I know you guys kind of we all kind of have the same style when it comes to promotion which is cool yeah there's um, no bottles on the flyer you know yeah <laughs> that's that's always nice you know like two dollar beers on, yeah uh, exactly happy hour. yeah 
Yeah, there are some bad ones out there. But yeah, um, interesting. Yeah. All right. So, you know, you talked about creating and building your brand. How has Rated R and how helped your brand? And kind of what are some of the things you guys are doing together? Uh, I think that it was really, like I said, when, when we had initially met, I think that sort of started showing me ins and outs of nightlife in general. So I think it sort of kind of like got me on the same page of what to expect when you're going into places, uh, what places look for and yeah. when they're trying to hire somebody. And again, part of it is, you know, fitting their image. You know, if you're going into a hotel, they don't want something that looks, you know, crazy and, right. you know, like very aggressive. Um, so I think that's that's important. And, and being, you know, with Rated R, I think that uh, when Ron and I started kind of like talking outside of work, I think that's when we started realizing that we were kind of on the same page. Right. So he actually was able to show me a lot of things that kind of just enhanced or, you know, uh, made myself look better, you know, and get to a place faster, you know? And I think uh, I, I kind of did the same with him a little bit, you know, like I think it was a two-way road. It wasn't necessarily, you know, one yeah. thing. So, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, even after that, you know, that's actually how I met you guys. You know, I think you guys had a, a call out, a last minute call out one night. And I think it was either you or Gary that contacted Ron and was like, hey, like, I know these guys in Jersey and, uh, you know, they need a cover if you're off tonight. And yep. I think, honestly, I think that's exactly how we started working together. <laughs> I think nah, that's I mean, and, and again, that's usually how it works, right? <clears throat> we, we have a relationship with Ron and we trust each other. And it's like, all right, if Ron trusts this person, we're going to trust this person because it's just how it works. You know, we, we've created that working relationship and friendship that we can do that. So I think that's And, and that's honestly, important. I think that's really, really important. Yeah. I think that's the, that the most progress I've made in the least amount of time has actually been from working with Ron and all of the people on our roster yeah. and then also working with you guys, where I think that's where like my career as a DJ sort of accelerated, you know, very quickly. It was because I actually like the people that I'm working with. Right. So it's, it's easier for you to call me or for him to call me and say, hey, like, you know, I need your advice on something and you know you're going to get an honest answer. Yep. And I think that's like extremely important as opposed to, you know, it's, it's good to maintain a, a professional relationship for sure. But having somebody that you can kind of count on, you know, like without judgment, is, right. it's going to help you go further, I think. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think teamwork makes the dream work in this world a thousand percent. Um, especially when everyone really is on the same page and understands the vision of how we're going to get from point A to point B, right? It's kind of cool how it starts, right? Like it starts off like you meet a guy and you're like, okay, like we're gonna start working together. He's a great DJ. Then you start finding out he's got obviously other talents. Everyone's got other talents. Yep. But the willingness that they want to grow something with you as well yeah. is such an awesome feeling that, uh, you know, I, and I still work with some guys that, that you know, I use as fillers or, or they're great DJs and it is what it is, right? That's yeah. what I'm hiring them for. They get paid and that's it. But it's really cool that other people want to kind of help you grow what you envisioned in the beginning and it's now everyone's vision it's right. not just yours anymore you know so um, it is a really cool feeling i really think cool. that's my favorite part about every, about get down honestly yeah, it's just like sure. the guys we're working with right now that like everyone really understands it and you know the creative side of things and putting out content whether it's music or videos or whatever everyone's kind of seeing what's happening and kind of take taking it out on their own lane which yep, is cool yep. too because you see their creative side come out also yeah for sure so Definitely. um so i'm going to transition i mean so you started your business in new york city which probably right now is one of the toughest markets right for nightlife yeah i mean I mean, manhattan is is a, a it's, fraction of <laughs> yeah, what it was tough. even five years ago right for sure so what do you what are some of the things that um you look for in working with your guys and some of the things that you think have helped you be successful in new york i mean uh so it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before you kind of have to offer um a little bit more than what everyone else is offering right you have two options you can either go into a venue and totally undercut whoever's there which is not how i like to do business yep. or you can go in and essentially work twice as hard for either the same amount of money or a little bit more. So you right. have to offer more. So we go in and uh, like Nick was touching on before, he does graphic design. I mean, I, I, I'm i okay. He's really good at yeah. it, right? So when I need help, I ask him. We make the flyers every week, which I've seen you guys do. Uh, we do recap videos, which I know you guys do as well. Yeah. And what's cool is having a team then if, 
one person puts it out there, the other people can put it out there. So now I go in and put my uh, general manager hat on and I talk to the other manager there saying like, listen, instead of getting an invoice every week and having to deal with 10 different DJs every week, 10 W9s, yep. 10 everything, right? One invoice a month, I'll pay my guys out of my bankroll, I'll pay them. I'll chase you for the money. Yep. We'll do uh, promo flyers for you on, you know, off the cuff. We'll do videos. We'll do it. And they're like, whoa, really? I'm like, yeah. And I could even provide equipment for the venue. Yeah. So I, it's just all the extra work you got to do. I feel to like get your 60 second elevator pitch is very similar to ours. Did I just sell you? No. <laughs> <laughs> sell me this pen. Right? <laughs> no, no, but, but, but that's really how it is. You know, you could show somebody like a, a bunch of links or a bunch of videos or a press kit. And it's all necessary because when someone does ask you for it, it's embarrassing yeah, not it. to have it. Yep. But, um, I mean, that's that's you got to sell yourself to them. That's it. And a lot of it is uh, through who you know through however many years, right? We work together. Like we were just saying because we trust each other and and all that. Um, also, do not copy and paste emails because I've gotten so many emails for bookings that have the wrong name on it, the wrong venue on it. So don't do that. <laughs> Whatever you do, take time and write it out. You know, a, yeah. a personal connection really goes a long way. With so somebody. you understand some of the things that the venues are looking for, right? So what are some of the things that you're looking for in guys that you want to work with besides just creating a friendship? Like there's obviously certain things that you, you want to see and they, certain things you don't want to see. They got to look like this guy. No. <laughs> um, so honestly, what, what I, what I really look for, I, I didn't really even realize I had an ear for hearing this stuff. Like until I was looking to build my brand and looking for DJs, I didn't, pick anyone that was rocking or headlining. Everyone that's on my team I met when they were opening up for somebody, when it was slow in the club, if they can rock a crowd of 15 people yep. and all those 15 people are dancing, you're good. Anyone could do the rest of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not, it, it takes work too, but no, anyone saying, could though. play the bangers and if it's a packed club, if half the room's dancing, it looks full, right? Yeah. So I met them opening up for somebody they didn't burn the DJ, they played everything, they played it right. I didn't have to say nothing. I let them do their own thing. And that was it. Yeah. You know? Uh, just just that and, and being a good person, being honest, um, having integrity in what you do. Um, like we were saying before, you kind of have to adjust the times now and you do have to take the videos and the selfies and yeah. make sure you're kind of wearing the cool gear and stuff like that, right? But it's a fine line to walk and it's really hard to do it, keeping yeah. your integrity and still being able to play the game a little right. bit, you know? And and Gary and I talk about this all the time, you know, being able to adapt to your market is so important because there are guys who, you know, have been doing it a while and they don't want to do this stuff. They mm -hmm. don't want to post the videos. They don't want to yep. do their own flyers. They're like, well, I made it this far. I yeah, should just be able to keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. So I just want to talk about adaptability a little bit because I know, you know, both of us, we, we gain accounts, we lose accounts. Yeah, sure. Um, so what are some of the things that you do if you lose an account? I know you have some other stuff going on besides mm -hmm. DJing, and I sure. think that would be something cool to talk about. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, again, it, it goes back to when I was working in hotels and stuff. Um, I mean, I do book DJs and stuff, and that's really my passion. Um, I started booking jazz bands and bands at hotels, and, and it, it's all through the same core values that I hold to growing Rated R as a business, you know? So I have another business that... that um, you know, I book uh, jazz bands, performers at different restaurants, hotels, rooftops, and it can kind of go hand in hand with the other thing as well, you know? Right. Um, I would say if, if you're a DJ and you can do graphic design, uh, build on that because that will also, if you're helping other people uh, design some things and if that's your thing, then you can probably maybe get some gigs from that as well, you yeah. know? Or you get an account doing social media for a nightclub or a hotel. Eventually you'll get in there, yeah. you know? Um, so it's, it's about that. Uh, if you lose an account, keep staying out, man. I mean, I go out when these guys are DJing, sometimes spend more than whatever money I'm, I'm, I'm making, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I put my liver on the line for this business, you know? Um, but that's, that's really what it is. And, and don't be fake because especially in this industry, if, if you make it past two or three years, like, you're in, yeah. you know? So if someone's going to bullshit me when I have 15 years, like, I'll read it in two seconds. So yeah. why are you going to... Just be honest. Be yourself. Um, even when it comes to the pictures and the images that you're posting out there, do it how you want to do it. Eventually, you'll find people because there's so many places to work at that like what you're doing and right. will work with you. You know? Yeah, I agree, man. And I think you brought something up about just being able to go out and network and how important that is. It's, it's important, but again, don't be fake when you're yeah, doing Yeah, you can't it. be fake. <laughs> you... Because... I can tell when people are being fake. You can tell when people yeah, are being fake. Yeah, because then then you're just that annoying kid that's begging for the gigs and they're like being fake. Really yeah. connect with these people and have conversations about 
their family or uh, I don't know their favorite color or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. So. So switch over to Nick. What What are some of the ways that you're networking, and what are some of the things you're doing in New York to try to kind of not only grow your brand but also help out Rated R and kind of uh, you know maybe pick up other accounts or or do other things like that. Yeah, I think uh, every once in a while you get like a random gig that comes your way that just kind of, I don't know, if it's through Ron or if it's through one of you guys or it's somebody that, you know, uh, one of our mutual friends has that like, oh, like, you know, this place needs a DJ, whatever the case is. Um, I think that the best thing is kind of really just to kind of research the venue a little bit and just kind of see what it's typically like. Uh, like something I did more recently, I played at a, a spot that I've never been at before. And, you know, you, you kind of don't really know what to expect, especially if it's last minute. So I think kind of always paying attention and just reading the room, you know, is, is, yeah. is really important. I mean, I know that's a very common thing to say, but to actually do it, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. if, you know, if the room has 10 or 15 people in it and it's a couple of people just sitting down having drinks, you know, don't blast away and, yeah. <laughs> you know, try and do something. Um, and honestly, it's... I think that uh, that really helps you get new accounts because maybe they're not used to that. Yeah. You know, maybe they're not used to having the room being played the way that it should be for the people that are there. Yeah. Uh, so that's important. I, I think, think there's like, you can go at it two ways, right? So sometimes I like to do my homework where I'm going to hit up other DJs that I know that play the room. Or when I get there, talk to the manager, talk to the bartenders like, hey, what's the vibe? What are you looking for? Kind of thing. Sometimes you can go in and do that and have a preconceived notion of what the crowd's going to be like, and it could be totally different, and that might hurt you a little bit, but that'll go back to being able to read the crowd and being like, hey, this isn't working. We got to pivot and do something else. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's... I feel like you never can really describe a room accurately, and and maybe even the managers won't be able to either. Right. You know, because I've I've noticed that a lot of managers actually have very little knowledge of. of they music, want it to be you know, a certain like, way, yeah, but they so don't know what it actually. Yeah, is, they right? they want it to be a way, and like you can, you know, kind of read that from their description, but then it's yeah, like I said, they they might say that you know they want it to be a crazy party, but if there's only ten people in there, then. You know, you have to make do with what yeah. you have. And, I, you know, I think that's really important. And I, and I think that helps you get accounts. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and uh, you know, always being on time. I think a lot of people overlook rule number that. Rule one. Yeah, I think Actually, that's... Actually, rule number two. You know, rule like, number one is don't be a dick. <laughs> rule yeah. number two is don't be late. <laughs> Just don't be late. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's your job, right? The dream is to not have another job and go... So a level of professionalism that, like, I can trust these guys going there and then... You know, I'll give them like a heads up. Hey, talk to this person, right? That's it. Yeah. They go in, they do their own thing, and then they'll text me later, be like, "Hey, Ron, this guy was there. This guy was there. I met this person. This is how the room was." Then I'll take it upon myself to message back the person uh, that got us the booking or right. or the manager. Then, hey, how was everything? Uh, Nick's everything was great. So a level of professionalism that a lot of people aren't doing will give you a really big edge on whoever the manager or whoever's doing the numbers over there or whatever. Totally Just agree. Being professional. And, and, and looking at it as a business, right? You know, like what are the things that this business owner would expect out of me and how do I exceed those expectations? All right, so we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of what, how you look at playing a new room and, and playing a, a new uh, potential venue or whatever. So you guys have been have been booking some DJs from out of town in New York and also been going and playing out of town a decent amount. Um, so how would you relate playing a new room in your market to playing a new room in another market? Uh, I think here you, you kind of have an idea of what to expect because there's a lot of competition here. Obviously, so there's a lot of DJs, um, and respectively, that's the same elsewhere. Uh, but I have to say, like, going here, like, let's say Hoboken and Manhattan primarily, um, you, you kind of have an idea of what to expect, but when you go somewhere else, you know, like a place like Miami has, you know, a, a more of a Latin community, so you might want to adjust yourself, you know, yep. but, but that's something that's pretty obvious. But um, what I will say is that in Chicago, I felt that uh, they bring a lot more energy as far in, in their DJ yeah. sets. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, remixes being played and stuff, and, and it's by no means to say that they aren't like not as good DJs. In fact, I, I think a lot of them are much better than, uh, I think, I think, I think yeah, Chicago DJs are, really nice. are great. Um, and the first time that I actually went out there, uh, I was actually intimidated a bit. I was like, oh wow. I was like, <laughs> all of them can scratch really well. Um, they all mix really well. I mean, they're just, I mean, it's, it was definitely uh, an adjustment. And I think the second time that I went back, 
I think I was a little more prepared, right. you know, because I kind of knew what to expect uh, as far as like bringing energy. Yeah. I mean, even the openers are, you know, bring a ton of energy. You know, that's that's just what they, they want. I feel they, drink a lot. they do. They <laughs> scratch a lot and they drink a lot. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> I, I think too. There's anytime you, like Darren. in a new, <laughs> shout out to Dirty Darren <laughs> in a new market. Um, you know, you're gonna have like a four or five song feeling out period, right? Where you're like, Definitely. all right, this is gonna work or this isn't gonna work. But usually, you know, you're a pro, so you kind of like, you, you find what's working and you go with it, right? Yeah. So, all right, so you're booking other stuff in other markets. What are some of the things you do to either link with those people beforehand or after a gig? How do you kind of keep that connection going? Uh, again, to something that we talked about earlier, like just, maintaining a friendship yeah you know i think that's the most beneficial thing that you can do you know like if, if you kind of make it so obvious that you just want to play gigs like it's yeah I, I don't think like it might work initially it might get your foot in the door but it's it's probably gonna die off yeah and uh so i actually met a guy from chicago that i opened for uh in atlantic city uh, a couple of years ago and he actually was somebody that uh was really good uh, and very friendly, you know, and we had exchanged contact information and it turns out that uh, his connection in Chicago, they were actually friends. Friends, right. So it wound up being like, you know, I kind of had a, a good base of people to, you know, interact with, you know, beforehand. But, um, you know, again, it, it, a lot of the guys in Chicago and, and in Miami, I mean, they're, they're friends at yeah. this point. You know what I mean? It, it kind of started off the same way that, you know, we got our foot in the door, you know, initially. But after that, I mean, like, I still text these guys right. on a regular basis and joke about things or, or whatever. I think go once, out to get once you create the relationship, <laughs> once you create the relationship, you can then be like, hey, DJ XYZ, I'm going to be in town. If you got anything or I'm going to be around, like, let's link up. And most of the time, if you have that connection, they'll be like, oh, well, come rock with me at this venue. Right. And it goes both ways because... Once you have the friendship, if someone's like, hey, I'm in town, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Like, let's have fun. Let's play together. Like, we'll make the money work. I'll, we'll get some extra money, however, to make it work financially. Um, but yeah, I think that that friendship definitely it is, and is, is a great way to keep it's, it going. It's tough, too, because I'm not telling anybody to force friendships. You know no. what I mean? I, I think it was just... It has to be it natural, It just kind of right? was, honestly, you know. it was the right place at the right time. And, uh, you know, the guys that I wound up did meeting, like... I, I actually just genuinely yeah. like enjoyed like I think they were good people yeah. you know so like I actually just want to you know continue to check in with them or whatever and yeah. uh, and honestly we, we don't ever really ask each other for anything really you know and I, and I think it's just a matter of like they feel comfortable booking me somewhere and, right. and we feel that same way too and it just you know it just kind of works out that way so I think uh, where I was you know right place at the right time again it's just it really was just luck yeah. that it, you know, it just worked out that way. The same way that it kind of worked out with you guys. Right. You know? yeah. All right, so for Ron, so Nick is going to play these, these events in other markets. How did you kind of cultivate those relationships? And what were some of the things you did to network with, with DJs and bookers from, from out of town? Um, so a lot of it is, is, like I said before, too, if you, if you keep your integrity and you respect what you do, you'll meet, uh, I mean, or, or you just meet like-minded people, right? So you meet good people. Um, if Nick refers somebody to me, I'm not even going to think twice about it. I'll just do it, right? Yeah. Um, but sometimes it's getting uh, getting out of bed when they're playing and, like, I just go <laughs> and, and I, I hang out, you know what I mean? And just keep, yeah. keep relationships, talk to them, um, and stay in touch with them. Um, whenever, whenever they're in town, if I could help them out, like you said, I'll book them as well. Yeah. And uh, believe it or not, sometimes some people that we've booked have reached out to us. And I think it's because whatever reputation you've built throughout the years within the industry, um, especially, I mean, so, some of the older some of the older vets, like the, the OGs that have like reached out, it's really cool that they respect what we're doing. Maybe yeah. they appreciate that we respect the craft as much as they did before and are kind of walking that line and adapting um, all while keeping it you know, about the DJing and about the music yeah. and, and like that. And still making sure the business side of it is makes sense. Of course, right? yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a business. Everyone's got to eat, right? Right. But, um, yeah. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about NYC nightlife because it is such an iconic nightlife market. Um, a few years ago, I kind of took a, a few steps back because the market was changing so much and, and pay was different than what it used to be. But what are some of the things you're seeing now that are happening in 2020 compared to how the market was five years ago, let's say? Oh, wow. Um, okay, so, I mean, th there's there's a lot of things. I think a lot of the DJs that are still in New York, in, in, including ourselves, you know, um, 
there definitely is other markets that are paying more. Um, I think part of being in New York also, it's, you know, it's, it's the capital of the world, right? So if you get to play, people that are coming from different markets to play here, it's really hard to even get in. Right. So once they get in, they play a gig, they can go back to their hometown exactly. and maybe raise City. the prices as well for themselves because they're now DJing in New York. Every so DJ in the entire world wants to no, play no, in New sure. York City, it, right? It, it, it has its benefits. I mean, it's not as glorious as, as it seems, and I'm not trying to, <laughs> to knock where we're at by any means. Um, it's definitely eat or be eaten out there. Um, and, and and I love it. To speak on nightlife and the way things are now is, I mean, even just going out back in the day when it didn't matter if you had a fake idea, if you were 15, 19, yeah. or 21, if you went somewhere, it's because you knew somebody. If you didn't get in there, you did whatever you could to get in there, right? right? Into that club, into that bar, whatever it was. Nowadays, if you get turned away at one door, you could go literally right next door and get in for no table minimum, no right. bottle sales or anything like that, right? Yeah. So... With that, I think coming from uh, you know like a manager's point of view in terms of managing the venue, your numbers are going down. So if you can't sell tables or bottles at the door and pack the club like that, your numbers are going down. In terms, you got to pay the DJ a little bit less. So on on those terms, I respect that. I could see why they're looking at maybe cutting budget and stuff like that. On the other side, I see venues that are slammed, right, and they're booking. A $50 DJ coming out of college because he says he's gonna bring 20 people. Right. But what they don't realize is if that guy brings you 20 people, he's clearing 200 people from your room. Right. And those 200 people would have made you more than the 500 extra dollars you would have paid him a good DJ to DJ and keep everyone there. And I bring think it's zero such a people. Short sighted. <laughs> I don't know if that vision. makes sense. <laughs> no, but, I totally agree with you. But, I think that's part of the the 60 second elevator pitch, right? Oh no, yeah. Or they're they're so busy that they don't realize what spending the extra $300 how much more money that would make. If it's an extra three grand a night that the venue would make, multiply that by two times 52 weeks in a year, right. you know, that's a lot of money, right? I think so, it's, instead of looking at it as how many, how many, as a DJ, how many people can you bring? You should look at it as how many more, how many people can I keep here at the end of the night? The venue, how much more money, money yeah. can I get these people to spend who are already in the room, right? And if, yeah. if you looked at it like that, you don't see a loss in money. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can spend the extra couple hundred dollars on the opener DJ because they'll have people spending more money at the bar. Plus, what, what they don't understand is <laughs> when you book, I've had DJs come to the venue I'm managing and not know how to hook up their equipment. And, and I know how to do it, and I don't even know how to DJ. Right. But I'm like, if that's your instrument, how do you not know how to do that, right? And that's a whole different topic, but those are not the people you should be hiring. And I think that any DJ that doesn't know the fundamentals of it, and again, I'm not a DJ, so could be wrong about this, but they should practice the fundamentals of what they do before they start trying to go out and get into these markets. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think hiring the right person too, the, the more experienced people, they know how to kind of tell a story with the music. And it's gonna sound really corny and cliche, but, <laughs> and I'm sure you, you know what it is, like you go in high energy, right? Then you bring it down for a little bit, let people hit the bars. Like we are actually making the place more money. And I say we like yeah. I'm DJing, but, <laughs> but we're making the place more money because you're experienced enough to know that you can't keep it high energy all the time or you can't keep it too low. Like, so you're kind of going through like a rhythm that the other kids that are getting the 50 bucks, and, and I'm sorry if you're one of those guys that's listening to this, but I think that they should put someone more experienced in those bigger venues that can afford the budget. Yeah. You know, and that's that. <laughs> Do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I guess it, it's tough because I think what, especially what you guys are doing right now is you help people kind of like learn the ropes of this is how much you should be getting paid. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, because if, if you go out on your own, it's like you're kind of just itching for the opportunity. So you take the, literally anything, right? you know what I mean? Or you agree to do whatever it is to get into the room. But, and, and I can understand that to an extent, but at the same time, you're hurting the industry as a yeah. whole because now you're basically, you could be somewhere for a year and you know you take that initial you know, uh, opportunity for whatever it is, $100 or you know, whatever the number is, you've now kind of made that venue get comfortable with this is how much we should be right. spending for a DJ. And it's, you know, it's a, a it hurts. It hurts the, the group of DJs as a whole. Right? It really as does. Be, and, and you know what? They, they will be the people that also realize that, too, if they stick with it. Yeah. You know, if you stick with it for two years or, or so and, you know, you, you're really serious about it, you're going to start realizing, like, well, right, this, this is not enough. You right. know, like, I think, this is, I think with, with our guys, we've kind of made it an understanding like, hey, this is the absolute minimum you should take for a Friday or Saturday night. Yeah. And if you're taking less than that, 
number one, you shouldn't be, but you have it has nothing to do with our our crew because we don't condone it. And I think, again, if as a whole, we're all holding these venues to a higher standard of of pay and not even anything crazy, but I just think fair market value, right? And we all know what that number is. We don't even have to we don't have to say it, yeah. but you know, like. You shouldn't be taking those 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 deals that are less than fair market value because it is hurting everyone else. And and then you're right; it makes the venue think that it's okay to offer this much money, or that it's normal to right. pay that. When generally you know, that it's a brand little... new guy who just wants to get in any room they can get into. Especially knowing right. the, the the level of what you bring to the table, it's more than playing music. And we were talking about that before, but it's handling a lot more. If there's a sound issue, who are they going to call? Yeah, you know they're going to call you guys, right? Or Ghostbusters, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But so you're doing a lot more. You're there for, for, for the venue, for the team there. If you build a venue up, it builds your company up. Yeah. It builds your guys up. You guys have gigs. So if the venue understands that, it's really great when that happens. Uh, and nowadays it's happening less and less. So uh, hopefully it'll come back around. Yeah, just trying to create, <laughs> create better market standards. I mean, that's definitely one of the things that we focus on as a group is like, how can we make the community better for everybody? Whether it's you know, actual numbers and of, of pay or the hours that you're DJing or whatever it is, just bringing the community together. Like we try to do a lot of stuff with that. So yep. I, I don't know. I think that's all important for sure. All right. Yeah. We got anything else? What do you think? I think that's good. I think we're a good. Right? Close. Yeah, I think so. I do a mic drop? <laughs> uh, oh, you see, that? <laughs> see how good I am? I catch uh, that, catch that, that yeah. shit. All right, guys, so just want to say thanks for watching episode two of the Get Down With It podcast. My man, Rod Rodrigo, Nick Damaso, Rated R Management. Thank you, guys. It was a great convo. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Always a pleasure. <laughs>